I'm Aria Schwartz, along with Gabe Ibrahim, and welcome to the Windsider Show, where it's all about the W. We have a great show for you today with a very special guest, one of, if not the greatest coach in WNBA history, or just basketball history, Minnesota Lynx head coach and GM, Cheryl Reeve. like our show please consider joining our patreon community for less than a cup of coffee a month you can directly show support for the hard work we do covering the w everybody join me in welcoming to the show minnesota Lynx head coach and gm cheryl reeve cheryl thanks for joining us uh thanks for having me guys uh i'm a patron so i i, I for less than a cup of coffee i actually subscribe so i think we all <laughs> should do it <laughs> that's amazing i i appreciate the plug um, we're gonna clip that and use it in every podcast from here on out <laughs> We don't even need to do the intro anymore. Um, well, I, I, I we could get into COVID. We could get into the season being delayed. But I think the fans are more interested in really talking about your team uh, and kind of picking uh, your mind when it comes to this team and the league. So without further ado, let's kind of hop right into it and talk about your roster. Um, I think it's safe to say you left a lot of people scratching their head after you picked uh, Kiki with your first pick in the 2020 draft. Obviously, you have a lot more insight than us talking heads do about the whole picture and what's going on. But what about her skill set made you say, we got to pick you? Well, and I think I talked about this a little bit that, you know, we had a depth chart at a position that we feel like we could use some bolstering. Uh, and so, you know, we had her, you know, high up on our depth chart. And uh, she's somebody that I think uh, the best basketballs ahead of her. You know, there's uh, obviously her senior year showed some momentum, her ability to shoot, uh, you know, from a perimeter standpoint. Uh, she can play certainly the, the, the four position, maybe even down the road, the three position. I like her athleticism. I like her competitive uh, fire. Uh, I like that if you if you really study her defensively, you know, she's coming out a really strong defensive system. Uh, those are things that we value. Uh, you know, so it's a player that, you know, again, when all, when everything shakes out and you guys have all the information, you know, which obviously on draft day, uh, you know, the people on the inside actually do have a little bit more than the talking heads. Um, just don't tell the talking heads that because I think they, they think they know everything. <laughs> but but the uh, yeah, when everything all you know is said and done, you know, it'll make some sense. And, and uh, you know, we, we like Kiki. Uh, a lot. I think she fits well with the personality of our team in terms of what we're looking for. Um, and, I, and I just, I think she's a great fit in terms of the staff that we have that can mentor her. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see how, you know, time will tell on these things. You know, it's not about what she does in her first season. It's going to be over a period of time and, uh, and, and we'll see how things work out. And I, I found it really interesting that you said that, um, you know, she's more of a four and you can see her scaling up to a, a three. You guys have a, a pretty good three, four player, I'd say, in the Fisa Collier. Um, how do you think those two play together um, to start or, or how would, how are you going to manage that um, that dynamic on the wing? Well, uh, you know, Kiki coming into this the same way we did with Nafisa when we drafted Nafisa, uh, we said, you're a small forward. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to start with Kiki uh, as a power forward. And that's where we're going to need uh, the most depth. And, and, you know, really, if you look at the, you know, the, the draft dictates it. So it's not so much, um, you know, you, you kind of go, okay, what's the first round have? What's the second round have? Where's the depth of position uh, for uh, for this draft? And so, you know, we, we felt like that, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of depth uh, in the post in this draft uh, and in terms of, you know, skill sets that we would uh, find desirable. And so we knew that if we didn't grab it in the first round, it would not be there in the second round. Uh, and, and we thought that there was a chance in the second round we could get the help that we wanted on the perimeter. And it just so happened to, you know, to work out for us in that way. Uh, but I would just say that, um, you know, she, she's a power forward um, that, that uh, will defensively give us a different look than, than what we have, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in terms of even Nafisa. Um, you know, I, I want to play Nafisa more power forward as well. Um, but, but we'll see, you know, she's different than Dantas, um, and, and just different than Jess Shepard. And so I think that she's going to be a little bit more of a hybrid between a, uh, before I even say Rebecca Brunson, she's going to have to rebound a lot better. Right. 
but I would say she's closer to a Planet Pearson with the the ceiling of a Rebecca Brunson defensively, uh, not not the rebounding, uh, but her abilities defensively to impact plays, uh, to to play the way we like to play with some agility on the perimeter, uh, and that's what we saw appealing. And, and like I said, the the depth of the draft, the draft and the locations um, where you're you're projecting and you're hoping. Uh, but we didn't see a lot of a lot of depth, and if we wanted post help, it had to come in the first round. Interesting. I mean, those, those are some big names to throw out there for a, a rookie. So you you have really high expectations um, for Kiki. I'm just wondering, you know, uh, generally, what do we miss in mock drafts most often? Because obviously, Kiki was not projected to be that high. So what do we? What do you think we as analysts miss most often when we're mocking drafts? Um, well, I don't, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a broad brush. I don't, I don't want to paint with that. I think that well, some, some people that do those things actually, uh, do some research within the organizations and, and try to get some Intel and, and formulate based on that. Other people just have an opinion about what they think. And so which one are we talking about? <laughs> the ones that, uh, it, you know, in terms of the uh, location of where Kiki was picked, it reminds me a little bit when we took Denver Peters much higher than what people mm-hmm. thought. Well, what's much higher? Four slots. Okay, and so we knew that uh, Kiki was would be available at six, right? We weren't we weren't you know, we were sure of that. Um, there was exploration on trading down and moving closer to where we thought you know she she would be or should be. But when that, when those things don't come to fruition, you have a choice to make. You know, you want that player, you got to take. So you can't worry that well, it's like three or four spots higher. You You know, we we know which teams value her, and you know, so you're talking what eight, eight or nine. So what's the difference between six, eight or nine? You can't worry about that. Would you like to trade down? That's the best of all the worlds, yeah. But when it didn't happen, you just have to pick. You know, take your pick and keep moving. You know, what what do the the mocks miss? I guess things like that, you know, that you can't really, it's not as easy as just putting names on paper and this is how things are going to go. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of jockeying for position. And, you know, there's there's pump faking that goes on by organizations about who, you know, if, if they catch wind that somebody likes somebody, you know, there's a threat of them taking them. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, and maybe it's just really subjective. I thought this draft was much like last year, once you got past, in my view, the first five players, it was very subjective. And there's not a whole lot of separation. I mean, Crystal Dangerfield was taken 16. What's the separation between Crystal Dangerfield and Ty Harris? There's, there's, you know, it's just, it's not that great. Uh, well, inches, maybe. <laughs> maybe it's four or five inches. I don't know. But statistically, analytically, success of each player on the court, so if you could fill a need at six and give that same uh, uh, categorically, that same player, that you go, there's really not that much difference after the first five picks. And we all have now outrated much higher than the other drafts had. You know, so I don't know. I mean, it's not to say that the, the GMs and coaches are right and the, the talking heads are wrong. It's not that at all. It's just these things are pretty subjective. And I think there's a lot of copycat stuff. So if you don't see Kiki Harrigan's name, uh, when you start uh, looking at the, the players at mock or the uh, the mediums at mock, mm-hmm. you're not going to do it yourself. So you copy, and you get you know you get a bias about what you're doing. Uh, not you guys. I'm just saying in general, that's what happens, and, and that's, that's what I think happened there. But if you look at you know people had us peg to take a point guard. I don't know how many times I said you know we were not taking point guard uh, at six. It wasn't going to happen um, because of the you know, the, uh, the path that we chose uh, for our guard play. If you look at our roster and you write out a depth chart, you don't go, boy, this screams, they really need a, a point guard. Uh, could you use a point guard in terms of, you know, the lead, uh, true point guard? Maybe, you know, but I don't know that's the way forward. I don't know. Uh, you know, we'll find out, you know, with regard to the, the choice that we made. But unless you're getting Sue Bird or Lindsey Whalen or somebody like that, you know, it just, there's not a whole lot of difference between some of these these players. And that's, you know, again, ultimately the path. And uh, you guys didn't necessarily agree. Uh, I thought, you know, you know, Gabe gave us that scathing review 
of our free agency <laughs> and uh, you know but hey that's it if everybody has a right to have is an opinion and uh you know it's my job to you know try to execute our vision and, and see how that goes and hopefully we can come back on a year or so and go hey gabe you're wrong <laughs> or i come back on and go hey gabe you're right so oh, that's well, the fun of this right yeah i didn't do a mock draft just for the record so i, I was neither <laughs> right nor wrong yeah that's, that's a good place to live <laughs> very very safe Let's let's move on to a player that has a few years under her belt. Uh, Chechi Zandalasini, or as I like to call her, Zandy. She's one of those players that we've heard so much about. Of you know, po- the the ceiling of her, the potential of her is, is so big, and maybe she hasn't produced in ways that have jumped off the sheet just yet. But can you talk a little bit about what she can be in this league and what makes people have those expectations for her? Well, I think just watching her in Europe and watching her natural evolution. Um, progression as a player as she you know has, has gotten I mean she was 20 I believe uh, you know the first time we got a little bit of time with her that's just really young I mean that's what a junior in college um, and so you know what you're what you're seeing you know is obviously somebody on the world stage that is finding success and um, you know a little bit like Emma Mieseman in terms of their younger years where they're a little more uh, reserved reluctant uh, to take on uh, bigger roles and, uh, and 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 see themselves as a little more go-to players, I think Chechi that that mindset is changing for her, and and she's recognizing uh, in her season that she had uh, in Turkey uh, this year with with, with Fenerbahce was just really uh, indicative of I think what we all think she's capable of doing, and you know what we need is just for her to be in the WNBA more often. Uh, so that we can realize, you know, those, those expectations that we have. And, um, you know, this season might be the only one that we're going to have that uh, she'll actually start from the same place as everybody else. Once we get going, if we can get going, uh, everybody's, you know, uh, you know, that, that usually is unavailable for training camps is uh, now available. So it will be interesting to see how that might factor into her ability to, you know, carve out some really important space on our team. And for people who, um, you know, only only remember her from when she was playing with four Hall of Fame players around her um, and think that she's mainly a shooter or an off ball threat. Um, what what in her game suggests that she can do much more than that to you? Well, I, I think that the shooting was was actually probably the second thing that she did the, uh, the best. I think her her pull up game has been her bread and butter, her ability to bounce, bounce, raise or come off a pin down and, and rise up. Um, I think when I had James Wade on staff, when we first started talking about Chechi, uh, his comp, um, you know, comparable player, uh, was Simone Augustus in terms of not who Simone is in, in the fullest extent, but the types of shots that Simone takes, uh, in that mid range. That's kind of what her, her initial, uh, scoring, you know, the kind of bread and butter. And then, and then the three ball wasn't far behind. Uh, and then the, the big thing that, you know, you kind of go, okay, it would be great if she would add, would be, you know, getting to the rim, getting fouled a little bit. And you saw that uh, more this year, or at least I saw in watching uh, more attacks to the rim, getting knocked down, you know, getting a little more physically imposing about what she's doing. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think our fans recognize exactly uh, who Chechi is and, and, and they have enjoyed the heck out of uh, the time that she's spent with us. And I, I'm sure that they would be, uh, thrilled to have a chance to you know to see her play more, more full time and play an important role for us. I, I really like that Simone comparison. I, I definitely have seen that few flashes of that. Um, moving on to another player on your roster who no one probably knows about, Nafisa Collier. Uh, she had an amazing rookie season. How hard is it going to be for her to top that and, and stay consistent with that? And can you talk a little bit about? I've, I've been loving the. WNBA player comparisons you've been giving on this episode so far, because I think far too often people jump to the men's side to try and make comparisons. I I like to compare her, uh, which it might be a little bit of big shoes to fill, but I like to compare her to Tamika Catchings. Um, But talk to me a little bit about her game, what's underrated and what she needs to grow in. Well, you know, the the greatest thing about Nafisa um, is, is that she's got this sort of humility about her that, you know, she knows she's good, but she accepts information so well. Um, you know, if you, if you say, you know, we need you to improve on this, you literally just have to tell her. And she has this ability to apply immediately and then retain it. Like, it's not just, okay, I did it that one time and then I don't do it the next time. 
And then we got to keep saying things. The greatest thing about Fee is you tell her that part. It's like, it's like, you know, uh, you know, sticking, you know, some gum in a hole that and that doesn't come, that doesn't you know, break open. You got a new one you can work on. Um, so if you have holes that you're, that you're home, that you're trying to plug, she doesn't have many, uh, but she has the ability to fix something and then move on uh, to another thing and without losing that, that first thing that she was working on. And I think that uh, consistency is the word that you can use uh, from the piece of Collier. That is the greatest thing you can say about, I think, a player. You know exactly what you're getting. Um, I think she would tell you, you know, just an indoctrination into our great league, um, you know, the, the challenges of um, – you know, being in the final four, being on a great team like UConn, being drafted uh, just days later and then being in a training camp two weeks after that, uh, she never faltered in all of that. that. That's a pretty difficult transition. And then typically because of that transition, a player like Fee, who, who was getting uh, such, such a key role on our team, typically you hit a point where you fall off a little bit and stumble. She never stumbled. Uh, and so that to me was one of the most impressive things is she, she literally got better and better and better. Uh, and she helped buoy our, our franchise, uh, you know, and, and, and keep us in that hunt for, you know, a playoff spot and did it for the ninth consecutive year. It was because of, of not only Sylvia Fowles, but Nafisa Collier. Um, she, you know, what she gave us every day. What can she get better at? I think, you know, she would tell you, you know, ball handling because she's been a post player. Uh, something she saw more as a perimeter player was, uh, you know, the need to, you know, uh, avoid, you know, uh, a defender or help defenders, you know, how to navigate that. Um, certainly, you know, I think every player works on their shooting. You know, she's somebody that I think when she first got in the league was, was a short closeout. Then I saw if you watch video and you move through the league, uh, through, through the, the 34 game schedule, she became a long closeout by the end, uh, and that just speaks uh, volumes to, to her commitment to how hard she worked. Uh, if somebody told her she had a weakness, you know, she she works on it. So, uh, ball handling, fly around screens, and shoot the darn thing. Um, you know, defensively as a team, I, I thought we were one of our poorest teams at defending the post the way we want to defend the post. So I would put that really high on on fees list um not her fault you know that was absolutely th that rests squarely on my shoulders uh, there were some things that i didn't get uh, you know as, as uh, you know the commitment that i usually make uh, i didn't do as well there so uh, i have no reason to expect that when i you know get that commitment going again that that fee will be really really good at what we like to do and be really really helpful so I, i'm not sure if people are aware but i've been watching this team for many many years now um, and seeing it from my eyes, I know this got a lot of attention, the shooting and the scoring, it got a lot of attention, but to me, one of the most underrated issues was getting the ball to sill in good position. And I think a lot of Lynx followers really took it for granted when you have this all-star lineup led by Lindsey Whalen. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it was true in 2015, 2016, you know, half of 2015, all of 2016, her MVP season in 2017, in that she, Sylvia benefited from, uh, you know, a Simone, a Maya, uh, you know, make choices when, when that's what it's about on defense, right? You're, you're, you're choosing the lesser of the evils. You're, you're going to make a decision about what shot you want the opponent to take. Uh, and still had not really emerged uh, through 2016 as the top choice. Uh, and then when we lost the finals in 2016, um, you know, despite the way that we lost and the error by the official um, it was more than that for me. I, I walked away going, how in the heck am I going to have one of the greatest centers of all time? And I'm not making her the focal point of what we're doing. And so we did that in 2017, we had the same group. And then, so Syl, you know, came out and was MVP, just dominant. And then in 2018, everybody goes, okay, Syl's, Syl's not going to do it anymore. They even left Maya Moore. They left Simone Augustus. They left everybody to go guard Sylvia Faust. And, um, you know, in 2018, we were, we were pretty pedestrian, I'd say, relative to the past teams. Same faces, you know, same name on the back of the jersey. But, you know, things were changing. You, you could feel it. Things were changing. And then, obviously, you get to 2019, um, you know, Lindsay Whalen jokes that uh, she wouldn't be able to play in the league today 
because of the the uh, the value that everyone is placing on three-point shooting. That's not what Lindsay did. Uh, I assured Lindsay that I thought that she would be just fine <laughs> in the league today and yeah, would I remain agree. incredibly valuable uh, because people knew back then. I remember being in Detroit. We weren't worried about Lindsay's three-point shot, but it still didn't matter. She just found a way uh, to do what she does. Um, you know, she has a will. She imposes her will on you. Uh, and so, so I had maybe a player in Lindsay for many years, a player in Rebecca that maybe people didn't, you know, long close out to, but we navigated our way through that. We knew what our, our strengths were. Everybody played to their strengths, had a role. Um, you know, we got to 2018, everybody knows we had Daniel Robinson as our backup. So now I had two point guards that didn't shoot the ball very well. We get to 2019. Now Danielle's the starter. Um, you know, things got, things got a little harder, you know, I mean, Odyssey had a tremendous uh, season for us in 2019. Uh, but she's not necessarily known to be a three-point shooter. Very, very capable. But that's not the first thing that you think about uh, with Odyssey. And if he's a Collier came into the thing, not a very good three-point shooter. Uh, we need a Demiris Dantas to take a minimum of three, three. Uh, I'm sorry, 10 threes a game uh, for us to even get close to getting 20 threes off. Uh, and so, you know, that, that really fueled uh, a lot of our decisions, you know, in the offseason about what we were willing to commit to. And we need now – uh, to, to make Sill's life easier. And by the focal point, it's not changing. People are still going to choose Sylvia Fowles over every single player on our team. And that's not a knock on any of those other players. It's just that's how good Sill is. You have a choice between 65% <laughs> at the rim and a good three baller at like 38%. You, know, you can you know analytically say, okay, well, this is worth this, is worth this. I know a layup uh, is worth a lot. Uh, in terms of what your ability to penetrate you know, a, a defense. And, and so we, we needed to, you know, kind of create a, a better uh, playing experience for Sill. And what's going to happen is now I'm going to have players like a Chechi uh, that are like a Lexi Brown that are kind of going, okay, you really want to play off a of Lexi? You really want to play off a of Rachel Bannum? You really want to play off a of Chechi? You, you know, so make those choices. Do that now. And, and see what happens. Um, and so I'm hopeful that just Sill's presence is going to make everyone else a better player. And by virtue of that, at some point, it will loosen things up for Sill so she can have a, a more quality playing experience without three people uh, in her lap. Uh, that, was, that was really interesting, Coach. Thanks for that. Um, that really detailed answer. I have, two, I have a two-part follow-up. Could you just explain what you mean when you say a long closeout and a short closeout? And what other ways can you create space other than having, you know, static three-point shooters? Is there a different way to do that? Yeah. Uh, so short closeouts are uh, the way a defender would approach a player with the ball. Um, so a ball gets swung to somebody. If they're not a very good shooter, the defense would short closeouts. So you would stop short, give them space, and basically play off to, to defend a, a, a likely drive. Uh, when a player is a really good shooter, defenders prefer to long close out, get much closer to them, and make them uh, put the ball on the floor, thereby not shooting their, their money shot. Um, the name of the game in, 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 in utilizing shooters is penetration, uh, whether it's via the pass uh, or via the dribble. And so there's always space for, for static shooters, so to speak, as long as they can defend at the other end. Uh, there's always space for that. And then also uh, those shooters, um, you know, like I see Rachel Bannum and Lexi Brown as far more than just static shooters, um, but there are parts of their game that they need to evolve in and recognize uh, when, you, when you receive a long closeout, that's really good for our team offense, right? It's not just about, oh, they took away your shot. Well, no, they had the long closeout to you, so now we're going to get an overall better shot because now I can penetrate. The defender's out of position. Now I'm attacking, and I'm going to force rotation, and now somebody else is open for an easier shot. A closeout that you can't get to. Same thing happens when you throw the ball in the sill. Uh, you're going to collapse. And so you're, you want to put defenses in closeouts. Um, and then if they choose a short closeout, hopefully we have players all around that are able to knock down, down shots, and then we'll certainly be a, a strong enough rebounding team that you, know, uh, you get the 50-50 ball on the offensive glass. Um, and then that's, that's kind of the, you know, when, when it's a well, well machine, that's how the offense works. 
So you, you've talked about this briefly, uh, or you touched on it in some of your answers, but can you talk to us a little bit about the differences in styles of play that we've seen historically from the Lynx and what we're seeing from this new look Lynx? Um, well, I, I gotta kind of go through my, my mental bank of, of styles of play. Well, I would say that probably, you know, we, we evolved, you know, through each kind of, you know, a couple of years, depending on who was in the post for us. Um, you know, in the early years when we had Taj McLean and Franklin, we put the ball in her hands a lot for some decision making. We inverted the offense. I had really good post up guards in Lindsay Simone, not my in her rookie year. Uh, Becky Hammond guarded my in her rookie year, which you know, we said we just never let her live that down. Uh, she evolved, and by year two, my perimeter players were the better post up players, so we inverted the offense, and and post players were happy to pass. Insert Janelle McCarvel, uh, and you essentially have two point guards on the floor. Uh, so we continued down that, that road, uh, in 2015, midway through the season, um, we sort of kind of had to become like, okay, who are we now? Are we still this corner offense, elbow catches, uh, guards, you know, posting up that sort of thing. Who are we? No, we, we're Sylvia Fowles. Uh, we had to, you know, kind of feature more post oriented, uh, post-ups. So the things that you typically do for a post, your cross screens, your rip screens and things like that to bring your. Uh, you know, onto a block and throw it in and let her go to work. Uh, so that was probably the fundamental thing is that guards were posting up before so and now still posts up. Uh, we still value, most teams do, you know, four players that uh, have the ability to, you know, to make entry passes, you know, to make reads. Rebecca Brunson in her, in her um, 2018 season, uh, career high in assists. We gave that role to her. You know, she really, uh, uh, you know, accepted that challenge. Uh, Demiris Dantas, same thing. You know, look at her number of assists. It's high. Um, so that that style of play sort of has remained through, you know, maybe that decade. Um, you know, the the idea that Sill is occupying the interior is probably the fundamental change. Uh, and, and that's obviously going to, you know, uh, still be the thing. Can you be a hybrid of those things? Yes. Uh, we will have some lineups that will be a better corner offense lineup than than one that has Sill in it. Um you know, I think that we've evolved more pick and roll. I had one of the worst pick and roll teams of all time during our championship years. Uh, and, you know, this pick and roll thing was so huge and people, everyone pick and roll, pick and roll. Look at the Minnesota Lynx. We stink. We're like at the bottom of the league and pick and roll. Well, you can focus on that or you can go, well, that's okay. We're really good at this. <laughs> this is how we're going to score. We're going to be a little different. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, but, but I'd say that we now have become a little more pick and roll dependent, uh, you know, closer matching some of the other uh, styles in the league. So uh, I, when we talk to players, typically, most of our interviews are with players. They often talk about during the off season how they're trying to hone their craft and grow their game. I'm curious for you as a coach, what you do during the off season to hone your craft, maybe adjustments or, or plans and things like that, uh, maybe adjusting to league trends and things like that. Uh, what do you do to kind of hone your craft during the off season? I think we do a lot of studying. I think every coach would tell you that. We, uh, we, we kind of replay the season multiple times, even though you've already watched it. However many times when you were in it, when you were out of it, when you're out of season, you see things more clearly, just like anything in life. Um, and sometimes I sit there and watch going, what in the hell were we doing? You know, like who, who's coaching that team? That's horrendous. Uh, and you kind of go, okay, well, we're going to make sure we don't do that again. Or I watched and I go, I didn't realize how bad we were at doing this or doing that. And I better, I better make sure, you know, let's get back to our staples. Uh, so trying to be a little more self-aware about, you know, what did they hear from me? Why, why did this happen? Why were we great at this? Okay. Let's make sure we, we can continue that. Um, are there any trends? You know, I know that in 2016, I feared that we would not be able to uh, keep up with the three point shooting of LA, which in that year was really good. Uh, I, I, was, I was afraid we wouldn't make enough twos uh, to keep up because we weren't changing. Uh, you know, Simone Augusta is one of the greatest mid, mid-range players of all time. Lindsey Whalen, you know, one of the greatest finishers of all time at the rim. You know, obviously Maya was like our three baller. You know, Brunson was my rebounder. Uh, you know, obviously still on the inside. I was concerned. Uh, and so we, you started to feel like, okay, this, you know, this, this movement towards a three ball. We got through it in 2017. Uh, still shooting the mid range, but now you see championship teams are, 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 you know, clocking in about, you know, 25 threes. So you got to make a decision, you know, is this, is this what you want to do? 
Um, you know, can you do these things without sacrificing some things that you know it takes to win basketball games in our league? You know, so you try to stay current uh, for sure. Um, and then you just look at, I know for me, you know, professional growth, you know, who you want to be to your players. And, um, you know, again, mostly I'm, I'm pretty critical of myself. Uh, so I see lots of room for improvement. And uh, I try to identify some things that I can work on. Um, some are reasonable and some are not. <laughs> uh, some things just will never be. Uh, but I go in well-intended in most seasons. Uh, but sometimes I reach goals and sometimes I don't. Uh, and this is this is another broad esoteric question for me. Um, but do you think that um, do you think like team building influences strategy more than the other way around? It, it, are you having a strategy and then you're building to that strategy, or is it the, the opposite? Um, when you say team building, uh, culture building, Ro roster um, building. Sorry, or roster building. Okay. Oh, no. I mean, absolutely. It's, it's all about um, taking what you have and um, taking the strengths mm -hmm. of those players that you know uh, how many shots are this player going to get, this player going to get, what type of shots, how do I, you know, tweak what, we, what we've maybe always done? Do I have to scrap something, add something? Absolutely. You want to fit what you're doing uh, strategy-wise to match, um, you know, the personnel. There's no doubt about that. Coach, I'm curious your opinion on this because uh, you have a wide, strong opinion on a lot of stuff. But this has been a topic that the talking heads and the W fans have been clamoring about for a very long time, but it's really picked up some attention recently. The amount of talent that can't make a WNBA roster. Obviously, there's many, many elements that go into it. But if we could try to ignore the business side of things uh, for a moment, I'm curious to you, what kind of comes first, expanding the roster, longer seasons, more teams in the league? What is the next step? Oh, that's, that's pretty loaded. Um, you know, I, I think, and, and maybe, you know, if we just say keep the business out of it, maybe even keep TV out of it, because I think this is what uh, would be the, the single biggest barrier. I think we could use longer games, 48-minute uh, games. Uh, like the NBA, so that we can play uh, our rosters more fully. Um, that hurts, you know, players 9, 10, 11, 12. Hurts their overall development. They have to be overseas, you know, to play and, and, and get their time. I think we could do better at 48 minutes. Uh, we certainly would like to see expansion. Uh, again, I know there's a business element to it. Uh, I also might say, you know, some of these players, I was, the, the league is getting really, really good. The quality of play in college basketball is going uh, exp exponentially up, right? Um, but I also would, you know, on the devil's advocate side, ask you to, if you were to expand two more teams, uh, show me the rosters for those two teams and tell me what you might have in our league if you have 14 teams. You might go back to those teams that only won four games in a year, seven games um, that are expand true expansion teams that take a long time uh, to get where they're going, unless there was a relocation team, which is not expansion. Uh, it is really, really hard. If you look at, you know, um, the, the early years uh, of, of Atlanta before they became, you know, a finals team, four games that they would win. Uh, so this league is really good. And so then to take um, the seventh player on every team, well, those players aren't good enough to compete with, with the, you know, the teams that are established with talent. They're just not. You know, so I'm not sure that you want that. I, I like where this league is right now. It is competitive as heck every night. You know, there, there's a fine line between winning and losing, and, and talent isn't usually the reason why you won or lost. Every team is, you know, I mean, yeah, you got your, you know, teams that have your uh, marquee names in the league, you know, like a Stewie or a Deladon, uh, you know, or a BG, Sylvia Fowles, you have that. But but largely, you know, every team has, has like a really good group of players that if you don't play well, you're not going to win. And I, I like that. I like this uh, era in the WNBA that um, this is our best quality of basketball every single night we play. And I worry about, you know, expansion teams that, uh, although the NBA is not worried about it when you got bad teams, you know, I always say that to myself, why do we worry about that stuff in the WNBA? We don't worry about the NBA. 
The <laughs> NBA has empty arenas in, in some, some teams. Uh, the NBA has unhealthy uh, financial situations. But in the WNBA, we think everything has to be perfect before we do anything. You know, the business model, all 12 teams have to be healthy. Well, that doesn't exist in the NBA or any other sports league. Um, so, you know, I, I think from just purely from a, you know, competitive, uh, it, it would be difficult to put um, a, a strong product on the floor for those expansion teams. That's just my two cents on it. No, hey, I, I appreciate that. That's a, that's something that I, I thought about, but I didn't think about it in the way that you explained it. So I, I appreciate your insight on that. It definitely opened my eyes to that. Um, Always have I, I agree right? with you. <laughs> Always helping us out. Well, Coach, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I, I'm super glad to get to pick your brain for 30-some minutes. It's always a pleasure. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Thanks, Coach. As we always say, we believe the players of the W and its community deserve the same in-depth analysis and respect that men's sports receive on a daily basis. With that in mind, please consider joining our Patreon community, like Cheryl, uh, to help us support us and the hard work that we do. Thank you.